Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm ha happy to introduce our speaker. Oh, sorry. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm uh, happy to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Lulu. Uh, Lou could not come uh, uh, personally to our seminar, so he will speak remotely. Uh, Mr. Lulu is a PhD candidate, candidate in Professor Andreas Lorkes Group at the University of Koblenz Landau. Uh, Lou did his master's thesis in China's Three Gorges University on the effects of mixing on phytoplankton blooms in Three Gorges Reservoir. Uh, he started his PhD study in Lando, Germany from May, March 2015, and his current study focuses on physical controls of methane bubble formation and transport in fresh water sediments. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about my PhD work. Uh, excuse me, could you please uh, switch the mode of presentation? Uh, to uh, slides, you mean? Yes, to slides. To, to slides, yes. Oh. Can you see it? <coughs> Can you see it? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank Regina for offering this opportunity to introduce my PhD work here. And it's my great honor to introduce yeah, our recent work. And my topic is uh, Rule of sediment structure in gas bubble storage and release. And we have uh, collaborating with the uh, University of Ghent in Belgium. And we pay particularly attention to how sediment physical characteristics affect the gas bubble formation and transport in freshwater sediments. And as many of you may know that freshwater has been recently identified as a, a big source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally. So, and this is especially true in reservoirs like dam rivers where most of the organic matter uh, rich sediment are trapped by dams. So we can see that actually the few numbers up in science later. So it altered the, the, the sediment flux patterns, which originally should be going to the, to the oceans. And for this reason, so uh, large amount of uh, organic rich sediments been trapped in sediments uh, by by reservoirs, so they can potentially produce large amount of uh, methane and CO2. And there's a good example in Germany, this is River Saar, and you can find about eight, uh, eight reservoirs in 100 kilometers. Yeah, our former PhD, Andreas Mack, did an investigation <coughs> during his PhD about in this, uh, in this river, River Sa. And what we found is quite new that uh, compared to the free flowing water, so the impounded river rate actually re uh, released much more vision, <laughs> almost two uh, order of magnitude compared to the uh, free flowing water. And this is actually comparable to the, even greater to the mean emission rates from tropical reservoirs. <coughs> and at the same time, you can see actually the bubbles, the bubble flags contribute most of the 
missing and CO2 emissions from this <laughs> reservoir system. This is quite significant. And so we try to characterize bubble flags. And our flag, uh, Mark Sanu and just Mac developed uh, the first prototype of eight automated bubble traps. So you can see this from the, this picture. We deploy this funnel shape, inverted funnel shape of uh, bubble traps into the uh, river. And so this basically can cover uh, one square meter and can measure continuous bubble flux over a few months. And we he deployed the four ABTs in River Sa and measured bubble flux over a few months. So people who studied methane bubbles um, maybe old, they know that bubble flux can be really very unpredictable. Because sometimes you see bubbles, but sometimes you when you get there you can't see any bubble at all. So but in the short term we do see a pattern here. You can see that uh, we have ship lock um, activities in this reservoir in, in parliament. And when sometimes when ship would, uh, when ship passing by, so we can see change the water level significantly like by a few centimeters. And accordingly, you will see instant response of the uh, uh, bubbling. So we can see actually there's a pattern that in short term, the bubbles can be triggered by water level changes. But what about the long term? With long term, we have uh, already one year long term emulsion measurements by these uh, ABTs. And we can, the first impression from data is that it's very noisy, of course. So the red line is the temperature, so the blue line is the bubble flux measurement. And uh, the one chart at the bottom is the, the discharge of the river. And after we smoothed the data, so we can see it clearly. Uh, there was one big event in ABT2 where we found only one uh, single event which deleted 13% uh, of annual emissions in nine days. So that means this suggests a large reservoir of accumulated jets in sediment relative to the normal flux. <coughs> This is quite uh, significant, actually. <coughs> so we also try to look at the relate to the bubble flux to uh, to other factors like uh, long term change of the what uh, water temperature. So we did modeling. Uh, we tried to relate it to potential methane production rates which is largely determined by temperature. So the figure shows that uh, the comparison between observation and modeling of methane flux. So the dotted line is the uh, temperature. So the yellow line is the observation. And the, the heavy blue is modeling results. And we see that's roughly, so the methane flux follows temperature quite well. But sometimes, uh, especially in winter and summer, sometimes the, so this temperature dependency breaks down. So here comes our big question. So if the seasonal variation in evolution same follow production rates very well. So how can we explain this nice discrepancies between short-term evolution flux and simulation? Well, obviously, we have very limited understanding about the mechanism of uh, 
gas bubble formation and release the sediments. So we aim to develop a process-based mechanism, mechanistic emulation model to model this. So we did one uh, form incubation experiment in our lab, and we tried to look at uh, also how one level change will affect this bubble flux in our lab. And as many of you might know that there are key controlling mechanisms of the bubble formation, or maybe bubble storage in sediment. <coughs> so in co cohesive thin sediment, so this linear elastic fracture mechanics, which is proposed by Bodo. And so at this mechanism, both the bubbles they are stored in sediment by displacing a sediment matrix, like together, like liquid and solid phase. The other uh, mechanism is in coarse material, like in sand. They probably uh, so these bubbles they displace pore water from this uh, capillary pores. Like without change the structure, like the skeleton of uh, sediment. Basically, there are two forms of bubbles in sediment. So we try to look at uh, this, uh, uh, if we incubate different type of sediment, we want to know exactly how this will happen in different sediments. So we did incubation <clears throat> in our cellar at uh, temperature, at constant temperature for over ma one month. And here is the, how the chamber looks like. <coughs> and we have a main body around uh, 19 centimeter in diameter and about uh, 50 centimeter high. And we put oxygen sensor uh, in the water column, so we can monitor uh, oxygen level <coughs> directly. We also put pressure sensor and water level control, like we use the reservoir to control the water level. And we also use the gas bag to measure the daily, so to look at uh, the uh, total produced gas volume. And we also uh, use a camera to look at the, the top chamber, top cylinder, uh, to track the bubble size distribution. And on the top of the main chamber, so we have a two meter extended tube. So with this, we can have uh, about maximum, we have two meter uh, flexibility to we can change the water level in two meters. So how can we characterize this two controlling bubble storage mechanism? So basically this is a theory like the, for the capillary region, so we basically see nothing change in sediment water interface. <coughs> and but with the, the one the theory proposed by Bodo, so that large bubbles, they can displace the sediment matrix. So this will change the volume of sediment, which is reflected by sediment water interface rise. So we basically follow the, the change of uh, sediment water interface, and also we follow the water level change. So with uh, total, total uh, gas content, can be calculated from the water level change. And the rise of uh, sediment water interface will tell us about how much gas can be stored by this gas sediment expansion. And then we can, 
we can calculate this uh, capillary region trapped gas by subtracting uh, sediment expansion from the total. So here we get, we made a uh, assumption about uh, so the capillary in region tapped gas is uniform along depth, and this is only a uh, assumption. So we use uh, we want to also look at the gas content distribution over depths. So here we use the camera to look at the side wall bubble, bubbles on uh, the side wall of the timber. But here we have um, quite limited resolution, like uh, the low, the highest detection area is about one millimeter in diameter of the gas bottle. So we made such an assumption and we use the formula to calculate the gas content distribution over depth at one centimeter initially. And to validate our theory, we also look at uh, the full column gas content by actually CT scanning from the local hospital. So we select three uh, representative sediments and we did green size analysis. So here it shows the green size distribution clay, uh, steel, sand is quite good. And we also try to characterize the pores, the pore size distribution with uh, an MR, a method that can measure the, the water content and also the volume, volume of pores, water field pores in the initial sediment. And if anybody has interest want to know more about this technique we can discuss later and here recently i also measured green size distribution with finer resolution with the laser diffraction technique but it is only then for clay and sand we can see that we, i compared uh, the two sediments and also i want to look at how organic matter will change the green size distribution. So I removed some of the, I removed the organic matter from some samples by adding some peroxide oxide uh, hydrogen. So, so then I compared the one sample with organic matter, one without. So we have uh, <coughs> quite differently for, for clay, actually. We see that organic matter changed the, the, the gray size distribution most obviously for clay. It actually changed, uh, adds more coarse material to the clay. So that's why we see that uh, there is a large percent, percentage of um, coarse pores in clay, but supposedly to be small. Well, here, then we got, uh, because we have uh, we incubated our sediment in the cellar for over 20 days, so we found that the gas content development the sediment is quite likely can be, uh, can be characterized as uh, three phases according to the gas content, storage, and also the emulsion pattern. So this top figure is the total gas content, volumetric gas content, determined by what from what level change, and the lower one is emulsion divided by total gas production. So then, yes. phase one, that we can see that the first six days, basically there's very little emulsion. And we, we can see that gas content changed steadily, keeping, trapping uh, gas, uh, gas 
into the bubbles at stage two, we see increasing ebullition over time until they reach a point at phase 13. And basically, ebullition is quite steady. So when we got 100% for ebullition out of the total production. So this is a stage three. And then if we compare that how many percentage of the, this uh, on the right side, we have figured that uh, gas expansion divided by, uh, by total gas storage content. So we can see that uh, it's very obvious that uh, in clean for the first six days, is dominated by sediment dissipation mechanism, the bubble storage. And for sand, for the first five days, it's almost 100% trapped by capillary region, the gas content. So we can see that uh, it's quite obvious this for clay, this is in clay sediment is dominated by a uh, sediment basin, and the sand is dominated by capillary region. So based on the, we also would be interested in look at the, the gas content profile over time. So the gas content profile looks very strange to me. Yeah, for clay, we see a large gradient and also silt and sand. And for clay, the gradient starts at the very beginning, but for silt and sand, it starts at different days, like day three and day five. So here is the, 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 exam, uh, the results from CT scan, and we see quite consistent results that the upper layer trapped most of the gas the lower layer basically is trapped by capillary region, so we have uh, a constant gas content over depths. Like for sand, it's below uh, 10 centimeters, it's quite constant. And we also would like to characterize the, the bubble shape over time by using the data from the uh, side wall images at days at stage three, that we try to calculate this um, full size distribution. But quite, it's quite rough, but however, we have some useful information from it. And we can see that at stage three, we see <coughs> big bubbles, and we, we also see that uh, there are conduits, like channels forming from the images. We see that. Uh, there is a pattern that's in three. So we have uh, two peaks, like a bimodal distribution. In field, is not very obvious. For sand, is only one peak. So then we look at uh, how that evolution responds to uh, hydrostatic pressure changes. The y-axis is uh, ambulation divided by total gas content. We see it's very good relationship between uh, water level change and gas content loss. It's almost very, like 100% linear relationship. And also we try to look at the uh, <coughs> sediment water interface, how this change over, uh, when we change the water level. And it's also linear. That means when we reduce the water level, so we also see linearly we lost some, we'll lose some uh, gas bubbles from the like, gas content stored by uh, sediment expansion. And here shows the result 
uh, that we observed with camera, it's a half bubble size dis distribution in water column. It's very strange to me that uh, why so in sand and clay, we see that only one peak is a log lomer distribution. But for clay, we have two peaks. We have uh, smaller bubbles. At the same time, we have uh, big bubbles like 10 millimeter peak. Here, I try to relate this uh, bubble size distribution to our pore size distribution determined by from the side wall images. Although it quite can be <coughs> can be just a suspicion, but looks like it fit quite well. We tried to look at uh, this, uh, try to characterize this uh, pore size from the CT images, but eventually we couldn't do that because we have a very limited resolution. We can only uh, look at the bubbles with size greater than one millimeter. Basically, we have low information on bubble size, shape, and connectivity. And here comes some new questions from this experiment. Well, quite interesting is that we know for sure the sediment structure does matter. So change that uh, <coughs> different sediment ring size distribution will eventually lead to different bubble size distribution in, in work on. So that means Imagine in lakes in red walls, so you, you have a different uh, sediment texture. So eventually you will have a different diameter of bubbles that you found in water surface. And the second new question is, uh, so we found this uh, large gradients of gas content. And the they form because because of different gas storage mechanisms. So how this will affect the gas transport over depth? That's also another interesting <coughs> question to me. And bearing these questions, we started another experiment with uh, we tried to check bubble growth and migration by actually micro CP. So here we collaborate with our partner in Ghent University. So they have very good facility in, uh, in our samples with very high resolution. So basically we did two setups. So the first setup for the scan is uh, the full depth scans. So with full depth scan, we can scan our samples in three hours, like uh, 30 centimeter height. The resolution of the scan is about uh, 64 microns. And another, another strategy we use, we try to look at in more detail how these bubbles look like. So we, use, uh, we choose a, a region of interest about two centimeter in diameter in the center of the, the column. So each skin takes about 45 minutes and the resolution is about 20 microns. So here is the examples of, of uh, skins in clay and sand. So they look quite different. And here I give you an overview of uh, gas content development. And the first figure on the left side shows the, the total gas content in clay and sand in, during the 20 days of incubation. So we did, three, uh, we did five scans at different uh, days like day uh, one, day four, day eight, 
age 14, day 20, so we basically had to cover the three phases that we found in the previous experiments. So the right side, right hand side is uh, the it's the capillary imaging tapped gas content over the total gas content this percentage. So it gives you so when give you uh, impression. So when we start to, to have this uh, gas content stories by capillary region of when it ends. <coughs> Basically, it's the same. We repeated the same pattern for the uh, as the first experiment. And second, secondly, we also we try to measure the total dissolved gas pressure in sediment. And we see, interestingly, so that's, uh, we see significant reductions in total dissolved gas pressure during, which is associated with the, the, the gas bubble formation at stage one, actually. You can see that uh, especially very clearly for pain. Like the, this uh, gas, total dissolved gas pressure drop ends at uh, day four. So same here, at, when you look at the first figure, the top figure on, on the right side, right hand side, you can see that actually so capillary region stopped, capillary region process uh, stopped at day four. The same as uh, sand. So the bottom images show that uh, the large gas content gradients, we, we saw the same for the both sediments. This is from the, the CT scans, gas content calculated from the CT scans. And we can see that uh, it's special for sand. So the gas content below 10 centimeter is quite consistent. And here we look at the bubble size distribution, um, both over depth and over time. So first we look at the over depth profiles, day 20. And the top line is clay and the lower line is sand. See that uh, the surface layer of clay is dominated by small bubbles. But at lower depths, we see there's, it's mainly dominated by uh, big bubbles, but at the same time, you see small bubbles with well. And for sand, we see some big bubbles in the surface layer, like the, the black line in sand. And small bubbles at low depths. So we also look at the bubble size distribution over time. So we choose the surface four centimeter layer. And what we can see here is that um, dominance of small bubbles at day one. And after the, that, we see uh, a significant of uh, development of large bubbles since day four. But here, please note that we also see a large amount of uh, small bubbles since day four. And in sand, so large bubbles, bubbles in surface layer, surface layer we start uh, saw that after day four. At the same time, we say large amount of bubbles, small bubbles as well. So we try to visualize this bubble growth over time and different scans. So the top row is clay and the lower one is sand. So each of this uh, region of interest is about 
block is about um, 10 by 10 by 10 millimeter. So at day one, we say almost all the bubbles are quite small and they are quite perfect. They're perfectly uh, spheric. And at day four in clay, we see very well developed like bubble network. And after day eight, after day four, day eight, day 14, day 20, these bubbles are getting less. We have less and less bubbles in this one uh, unit cubic. And in sense, it's the other way around. It's like, so it's first day, it's the same. So we have uh, many small bubbles and day four, so we have more bubbles. Day eight and day 14, day 20, so we say huge amount of bubbles are more connected, looks like. And here we have a, a special case. So we see some like the uh, the rectangle, the red rectangle lines. So it's highlighted the, the one region, region of interest skin for the top layer of sand. So we see very large bubbles in surface layer of sand. So basically here we got a conclusion that over time we analyze that more open pores to sediment the surface formed. And we also see that enhanced bubble connectivity and also this induced this cause that uh, reductions in number of bubbles. And so we were really interested in that uh, how this uh, capturing region happened. What's the relationship between the pore size and bubble size? We take a good example in sand. So here we analyzed uh, the pore size distribution in comparison to bubble size distribution in sand. We don't do this in for clay because we have full resolution compared to the bubble size, either the, the particle size in clay. So here we see that uh, the bubble density of, as y axis as, and the x axis the diameter of the bubble and either, and also the pores. So the, the heavy black line is the pore. So we are, basically we assume that the, the pore size this doesn't change over time in the sand. So we say that clearly over time, when the gas content develop, so the, the pore volume start being filled by gas bubbles and the small gas bubbles can like peak at uh, 40 microns <coughs> and day 20 start all the small bubbles small pores they are filled by 60 <coughs> icons bubbles and those relatively larger bubbles like uh, the one that the other peak at 380 microns, they're only halfly like, filled by bubbles. So here see, we see that in sand bubble formation by including capillary pores is quite obvious shown here. And this causes actually and saturation. This is somehow explains the total dissolved gas pressure reduction as we introduced at the very beginning for this experiment, for the overview. 
and here we calculate the, the 40 micro meter micro bubble formation in sand. This is actually corresponding to 3.7 kilopascal, the total dissolved gas pressure reduction. This is actually comparable to the measured total dissolved gas pressure reduction in the sand. And so here I also show that uh, the top chart is the data from the is pore size distribution data from the first experiment, the timber experiment, we determined by AMR. So in both clay and sand, we see a lot of uh, uh, large poles, capillary poles, actually. This is uh, basically over 30% of them are large poles, capillary poles, and in clay, although it's quite little, but 1% uh, still they have lost. So we cannot get data for clay as the, uh, the pores from the CT scan, but we can speculate that most likely is case for clay as well. And here, for CT scans, we also we try to characterize, we try to follow the bubble migrations through the pores. So we did m scans. The first scan for the corner scan we did at 2 p.m. and the other we did at 10 p.m. For the same call, we leave it there and we don't touch them at all. And we <coughs> perform two scans at two, ten, uh, at two times and then we compare the two images. Then we can see clearly that uh, some water field core, like the black one, black is the gas bubble. At 10 p.m., they start, there are some gas bubble growth in the water field pores. And it's reflected by the uh, differential image at C, figure C. So it's a uh, black one, it's actually a bubble regrowth. And the lower one, the black one, is an example of a bubble migration. So the bubble trapped in the pole is gone at uh, 10 p.m. So that means this water field macro pores and conduits in surface layer, and because they are quite big, <coughs> so as the buoyancy of the bu bubbles is greater than the surrounding resistance like, due to the capillary uh, pressure. Once it's greater than that, so these bubbles can be released. And small bubbles migrate through this water field pores. And actually, this uh, the resistance is mainly determined by the pore throat radius. And here I give the example. This is a video I shoot uh, for the from the first experiment. I just took the video using my phone, so we can see that uh, this bubble migration uh, in sand. We can see that bubbles that are migrating through the pores, the conduits, and surface layer of sand. Basically, our results here confirmed our previous experimental results. And we also try to characterize this profile. And we calculate this uh, bubble migration and bubble regrowth rate. And when we have a bubble regrowth, i.e. that when the bubble regrow in the, in the pores, in the water field pores, 
at the same time, we will displace the pore water out of the pores. So we, at the same time, we can see that uh, this is water leaking. So we calculate this gas bubble migration, water mixing rate over that. So for clays, consistently we found that uh, it's very intense over depth. And for sand, we only see this at the top of 10 centimeter layer. Below this 10 centimeter, we can't see any bubble migration and what mixing. So here I get I give you a s brief summary because this uh, this work has been has not been finished yet. I'm still in, I'm still preparing writing the manuscript and but <coughs> based on what data we have. So I summarized the, the following bullets here. And the bubble growth both in sand and clay is controlled by this two famous mechanisms. And first by capillary region and then uh, followed by uh, sediment expansion. Triggered by what level change, bubble migration is through the macropores of sediment <coughs> over the world. But we see the intense bubble movement through the entire bottom in clay. We only found this uh, in confined up layer in the sand. Well, this stratified bubble migration pattern can be explained well by the relative size between pores and bubbles. <coughs> bubbles in low layer of sand was trapped in small pores, <coughs> which makes them very difficult to escape while the small bubbles in large pores they can easily migrate. So that's why so we have uh, this uh, intense bubble movement through the entire column in clay. But we can only say that very limited layer, a fine layer for them. And for the, these two work, these two uh, studies, we have uh, certain implications and future work I'd like to discuss with you. And we would like to further look at the effect of uh, sediment properties on bubble characteristics. And we would like to know that to what extent the size of uh, gas bubbles in what form is affected by green size distribution? And can we simulate this? And if we can do, so this can be very helpful for the evolution model that we are going to develop it soon. So this work will actually provide a basis for evolution model. And with this, probably we can <coughs> combine with the uh, hydrodynamic or uh, either sediment transport model. So then we can, can identify ambulation hotspots. And we see that uh, there is a big difference in different sediments that beaten depths of sediment can be quite different. So we would, look, we would also look at uh, how this will affect like solute exchange in the field. Because often it's the case that uh, we found a lot of publications in, uh, in rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. People claim that they found uh, increased nutrient fluxes due to the bubble release. Well, thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank 
uh, the following scientists <coughs> helped me with this uh, experiment. For more information, please follow me on ResearchGate. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, any questions, please? Uh, okay, so uh, I, yeah, yeah, the question is. <coughs> Uh, it's very. Is it, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, in both the clay and the sand, you see an accumulation of the bubbles before the top of the down from the top of the core. Yes, you don't see the accumulation happening below, but it happens just before the the sediment water interface. Is that? Is that just an artifact of, a, say, exponential growth of the bubbles towards the surface and then cut off by what, what's released? Or is, it, or is there something actually holding them there? Well, if we are back, if we're back to the slide, uh, I can see Yeah, I like you. <coughs> so if you look at the, the sand, um, <coughs> the bottom color, the gas content profile. So anything like the gas content below 10 centimeters at consistent, they still have like around 6 to 7 percent of uh, volumetric gas content. This is can be explained by capillary region. This is trapped by capillary region. Later I explained this by this one. Yeah, if you look at this slide. Basically this uh, heavy line, heavy black line is the pore, pore size distribution. So that means bubble grew uh, by displacing pore water out of the pores, but they don't change the pore size distribution at all. I don't know if I answer your question. I guess we should talk more deeply about those things, uh, you and me. Okay. Okay, any answer?